double displacement reactions, and the solubility table. So when you have an ionic compound that dissolves in water, it is going to break apart. The ions themselves separate. Um, not all ionic compounds will do this, but if they do dissolve in water, this is what happens. So if we have a sodium chloride, remember this is a crystal lattice structure, you've got the repeating pattern of a gazillion sodium ions, gazillion chloride ions. When they come in contact with water, water is able to separate those ions out and we get free sodium ions and free chloride ions. Now this would be happening in water. So when we go to imagine what this would look like, we need to make sure that we are not thinking of a formula unit of sodium chloride as being what's actually there. There's going to be lots of them. So if you picture some larger amount than just two of them, so let's say there's three sodiums and three chloride ions, um, when they go to dissolve, you'd end up with your three sodium ions that are free in water. And the water molecules, imagine that's an H and that's an H and that's an O. So you can imagine all of these water molecules would be surrounding these sodium ions. And the negative oxygen would be facing the sodium ion. And that's why the sodium has left the chloride ion to begin with. On the chloride side, the opposite's going to be happening. I'm just going to draw a little chevron to represent water. Um, but the hydrogen part of water is going to be facing these chloride ions. And this is why sodium chloride dissolves in water. So there are the water molecules drawn as chevrons. Um, I'll, I'll leave them out to begin with and then just draw them in as a simplified chevron version um, with the point of the chevron being the oxygen and the outside part being the hydrogens. So with a precipitate, this is when you have two solutions coming together and they form a solid once you mix them. This precipitate will form if you have a cation and an anion that are more attracted to each other than they are attracted to water. So initially they'll be in the water and then when they meet each other, so this silver ion and this chloride ion meet each other, they're going to form this crystal lattice structure that is a solid. That's what a precipitate is. That's what's happening in double displacement reaction. And again, we don't want to just imagine two of these silver chlorides because then it kind of looks like it's diatomic, which it is definitely not. It's an ionic compound. So just imagine that there's some amount of them making up this inconceivably large crystal lattice structure. Um, lots of them there. But to get this to happen from solution, you'd have to have your silver ions and we would be surrounding them with water molecules and our chloride ions surrounded by water molecules as well. And they would be in solution. But if you mixed this solution and this solution together, the silver ions and the chloride ions would be more attracted to each other than they are to the water. And voila, you get a precipitate of silver chloride. So again, these precipitates are made from Ions in solution that as long as they don't meet each other, they're not going to form a precipitate. But as soon as they meet each other, they're more attracted to each other than they are to the water. So they will come out of solution as the solid precipitate. If we started with a <clears throat> silver chloride crystal and we put water into it. So if I surrounded this with some water molecules, nothing would happen. It would not dissolve because, again, for the same reason that it came out of solution, it will not go into solution. So silver chloride is an ionic compound that does not dissolve into water very easily. We're assuming it doesn't dissolve at all, but realistically there's a certain quantity that would and we can deal with that when we do a KSB later on. So for now we're going to assume if it has not a lot going into solution, we'll just consider that to be zero. So if you did want to get silver ions and chloride ions into a solution, how would you do it? If you look at it, you know that they, they won't dissolve. You can't just take a piece of silver chloride and put it into water and have it dissolve because it doesn't want to dissolve. So if you did want to have them in solution, and again, imagine the water molecules surrounding these things. So you have these solutions with the silver ions and the chloride ions. Um, and we know that they're going to want to come together in a precipitate. Um, the, the answer is that we would have to have two different compounds dissolve into water separately to begin with and then when we mix them together we would get a precipitate. So for example you can take silver nitrate 
which has silver ions in it, and it will go into solution. It is soluble. Sodium chloride, as you know, is also soluble, and it has chloride ions in it. So if these are sitting in two separate beakers, they will both dissolve happily into that water. So you could have a solution of silver nitrate, a solution of sodium chloride, and they would just sit there with those ions floating around in the water. But if you decided to mix the two beakers together, you'd be introducing the silver ions to the chloride ions, and they will produce silver chloride because those ions are more attracted to each other than they are to water, so they form a precipitate. The sodium ions and the nitrate ions, they, they don't like each other all that much. They're going to stick with the water, and they're going to remain aqueous. So it's important to realize what this would actually look like. If you had one beaker of silver nitrate, and one beaker of sodium chloride, they will remain aqueous because, again, we have all of these water molecules keeping these ions apart from each other, and so they, wrong way, um, they will remain uh, in solution. They will remain aqueous. Same thing on the other side with the silvers. We're going to have the cations and the anions separated from each other by the water molecules. But if you decide to introduce these two beakers mix them together, the silver chloride is going to precipitate out as a crystal lattice structure. And again, imagine this giant, inconceivably large crystal um, formed of sodium, or sorry, silver ions and chloride ions that are more attracted to each other than they are to water. The other ions, the sodium though, it loves hanging out with water, so it's just going to stay hanging out with water. And the nitrate ions, they also love to hang out with water, so they're going to stay in solution hanging out with water as well the precipitate would be silver chloride. So with the double displacement reaction, this is essentially what happens. If you have two um, ionic solutions, two ionic compounds in solution, um, they will both have a cation. And you have an anion in each one as well. If you want the double displacement reaction to happen, there has to be one combination of the anion and the cation, or the other anion and the other cation that come together. So either AY here or BX, one of them has to be solid. And if that happens, you will get a precipitate. The other one will remain in solution most likely, but as long as one of them is a solid, you will have a precipitate forming. If A and Y are more attracted to each other than they are to water, or if B and X are more attracted to each other than they are to water, you will have one of those pairs forming this precipitate. If, however, neither one of those new pairs are more attracted to each other than they are to water, nothing happens. So imagine you had um, potassium iodide in a beaker and you had sodium chloride in a beaker. They're both soluble. They'll both dissolve into water. And so we have them surrounded by these water molecules and you have them sitting in solution. So imagine those chevrons again are the water molecules that are keeping these ions in solution. If you mix the two beakers together, the question is, will they form a precipitate? That's what we want to know. And really what you're doing is you're saying, okay, well, if the potassium and the chloride meet, would they form a precipitate? Or, we have a second chance, if the sodium and the iodide, when they meet, do they form a precipitate? So really the question is what we're doing is we're, we're predicting, okay, if the products could be sodium iodide or potassium chloride, are these going to be solid? That's, that's the question. If they are one of them a solid, if one of them is going to be a solid, then you get a precipitate, you have a reaction happening. However, if both of these end up being aqueous, so imagine you mix them together, and they were both, so now they're in one beaker, and they're both still surrounded by these water molecules, and none of them have come together to form a crystal lattice structure, that means both of them are aqueous, and that means no reaction has happened. So to predict whether a double displacement reaction will happen or not, you look at the products. If one of them's a solid precipitate, the reaction takes place. If neither one is a precipitate, they're both aqueous, no reaction occurs. We use 
what's called the solubility table and there's many different versions of the solubility table um, different ways to to work with them some are set up as a grid where you have uh, an y and an x axis and then you'd compare say like a and x and you'd find out where they meet and they'd write down whether it's a solid or whether it's aqueous if it's say a and y so those tables are good um, this particular one here is built to try to get you familiar with what things tend to be soluble and tend not to be so what you would do is you would use this table to look up if something is going to be soluble. So this square here is basically talking about things that are going to be aqueous. So what they're saying is nitrate with anything is going to be aqueous. So for example, sodium nitrate, we know would be aqueous because it says nitrate here with anything is gonna be aqueous. There are no exceptions to that rule. However, um, let's look at sulfate. Lots of sulfates are aqueous but there are some exceptions so for example silver sulfate is going to be a solid because you can see sulfate here it tends to be aqueous except for with these things here so calcium sulfate barium sulfate strontium sulfate mercury sulfate lead sulfate silver sulfate all of them would be not aqueous they would be more attracted to each other than they are to water, so they'd come out of solution. They wouldn't dissolve into solution. So we can use this as a way of looking at the things that are soluble, except for in these exceptions. And then there's also the ones that are very insoluble, but they also have exceptions. So for example, carbonate tends to be insoluble, except for when it's with any of the alkali metals or ammonium. So if you had, I don't know, let's say calcium carbonate, um, you'd say, okay, well, there's my carbonate and none of the exceptions are calcium. So what that means is this is the insoluble part of the table here. So calcium carbonate would be insoluble. So that's how the solubility table works. And what we do is we look up the products of our double displacement reaction, find them on this table and decide whether they're aqueous or solid. If one of the products is solid, we have a reaction. If both of them are aqueous, we do not have a reaction. So if we had, let's say, barium chloride and sodium sulfate, and we'd start off with them being aqueous because we want them to actually mix. If you want to get the reaction to happen, you got to start with aqueous uh, reactants. Um, and so if we combine these two together, we know we're, we're switching the cations. So the barium and the sulfate are going together and the sodium and the chloride are going together. So we will form barium sulfate and sodium chloride. But if both of these are aqueous, nothing will happen. So you have no reaction. So the question is, are these aqueous or are they sol uh, solids? Are they um, precipitates? So if we look up sodium um, chloride, so if we look at this particular table here, here's chlorine and it's in the soluble part and sodium is not one of the exceptions. That means sodium chloride is going to be aqueous. Any chlorides except for these ones here will be aqueous. The barium sulfate is the next one and we'd wanna look it up and here's sulfate here. So most sulfates are gonna be soluble except for, and there it is right there, the barium sulfate. So it is not going to be aqueous, which means it is going to be solid. So because this reaction here has a precipitate, this means that a double displacement reaction does occur um, and we, we actually form a precipitate. So I always check, predict your products, what they would be. And again, you, you could check them before you actually write them down if you know what they're going to be and then you know if they're both aqueous you get no reaction you don't have to write them you just write no reaction but if one of them is going to be solid you write it out and you balance the chemical equation there are two other double displacement reactions you want to watch out for because they um, don't form a precipitate but they do form molecules and you can think of molecules as being, they're kind of like a precipitate, they're just not an ionic compound. So they are things that come together out of solution and therefore you're gonna have a reaction taking place. So the first one is carbonic acid. If you get carbonic acid, it forms and then it breaks apart into water and carbon dioxide. So anything that forms carbonic acid, it'll then break down into water and carbon dioxide and therefore you would have a reaction. The same thing happens with ammonium hydroxide. It's also going to break down into water, but it breaks it down into ammonia, which can be a gas, and water as well. 
because you're forming these molecules here, the waters and the carbon dioxide or the ammonia, it is kind of like a precipitate in that it is coming together. It just doesn't come together as not a crystal. It comes together as a molecule, which then could bubble out and leave the solution. Either way, it is a reaction, and therefore you do have those reactions actually taking place. So keep an eye out for those two products, carbonic acid, ammonium hydroxide, and then turn them into their decomposition products, um, water and the leftovers, carbon dioxide or ammonia.